All right, so what is happening to America? Because there's a recent poll that just came out from the Wall Street Journal and the National Opinion Research Center out of the University of Chicago, which has demonstrated that there has been a major departure from what used to be considered fairly core American values. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the key findings of that, because to be perfectly honest, some of the analysis I've seen on this doesn't seem to match the numbers that we're looking at. So we're actually going to look at what are people saying now versus what they were saying back in 1998, what that has meant for the country, and then perhaps most importantly, instead of just leaving you with a message of doom and gloom, stick around in the end. We're actually going to talk to you about practical things that you can do as an individual to be able to counter some of the things that are going on. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. Welcome to the first ever live stream of the show to, on this Tuesday. I have a couple pieces of business that we need to go over before we can get into the stream. Number one, we hope everyone had a great Easter. He is risen, absolutely. Number two, we need your help deciding on when to go live on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, we're temporarily going live at 12 p.m. each Tuesday and Thursday, but I put a poll on the Make, Making the Argument channel that you can go to in the link in the description. Help us choose what time to go live. Click that link and submit your vote there. That would be a huge help. Number three, we have a goal by May 1st to get 1,000 subscribers on the Making the Argument channel. So if you can help us reach that goal, that would be incredible. Link in the description. We're excited to see your comments today. We're only able to look at one chat, though, and that's on the Making the Argument channel. If you're watching on the Nick Freitas channel, head to the link in the description. Click there. We are live on that channel as well. We'll be looking at the comment section. We look forward to seeing what you have to say. And finally, if you're a member of our Volley chat, you know that Volley is shutting down on April 30th. We've talked back and forth with some folks in our community chat about what we should use next. Discord has been brought up. We love that y'all are helping us make that decision. I want to thank everyone who has submitted a potential platform for us to use. We will let you know next Tuesday what we decide to move our community chat over to. And now let's get right back into the show. All right. Well, again, once I, I just got to thank everybody because our YouTube page shot up from like 7,000 followers to over 260,000 in a relatively short period of time. And that's one of the reasons why we're setting up a separate Making the Argument channel so we can really focus in on that and serve the audience better. Once again, I am your host, Nick Freitas, former uh, SF, current member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a reasonably good guy. With me, as always, my beautiful bride, Tina, Queen of the Bees. Hello, everyone. And then we have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. Hi. And then, of course, Nick Hamilton, producer Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. I got to unmute my mic. That would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited for today's stream, Nick. I think it's going to be great. Let's get to it. Okay. So, and, and again, obviously going live, if there's any technical difficulties, it's all Hamilton's fault and we'll replace him immediately. Wow. All Thank right. you. All right. <laughs> you're, you're a valued member of the team, Nick. All right. <laughs> So here's what we're going to do. Christian and, and I, we've been, we've been reading through not just this article, although we do think this article does a good job of talking about it, but this, this poll. Uh, like I said in the beginning, this poll is from the, the National Opinion Research Center and Wall, Wall Street Journal, and it really talks about the ideas of what used to be considered kind of core American values around everything from patriotism to families to education. And what we're finding is there has been a significant shift. I mean, we're not something minor, a significant shift over the last 20 years on how Americans view these values. So without further ado, Christian, let, let's head into the Wall, the Wall Street Journal article on it and talk about some of the numbers. Sure. So um, for those of you that are watching us live or watching us after we go live instead of uh, listening to us, um, we've got the article pulled up on screen and we're going to read through it for our audio listeners that are going to come back around and tune into the podcast after we're done with the live show. Um, so this is from the Wall Street Journal, and it's titled America Pulls Back. By the way, this just came out like like basically like two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and we've been wanting to talk about this for a while, but we wanted to save it for our first live stream because there's some really, really crazy points in here. And the article's titled America Pulls Back from Values That Once Defined It. Um, uh, Wall Street Journal, NORC poll finds. And then it goes on to say that patriotism, religion, having children, and some other really important factors that we usually associate with a strong, stable society, they're all on the decline. Um, the article begins with this. Patriotism, religious faith, having children, and other priorities that help define the national character for generations are receding in importance to Americans, a new Wall Street Journal, NORC poll finds. The survey conducted with NORC at the University of Chicago, a nonpartisan research organization, 
also finds the country sharply divided by political party over social trends such as the push for racial diversity in businesses. We've talked about that before. And the use of gender neutral pronouns. Some 38%, this is the crazy part. Yeah. And we're going to get into each one of these points here. Some 38% of respondents said patriotism was very important to them. And 39% said religion was very important. That was down sharply from when the journal first asked the question in 1998, well over 20 years ago at this point, when 70% deemed patriotism to be important and 62% said so of religion. That is a unbelievable collapse. When I actually found this article, I shared it on my Facebook and I said, this is what the collapse of a society looks like right here. When you have what? More than two thirds of Americans uh, one generation ago say these are the values that I think are critically important to me, to to my community, to my country. And then 20 something years later, you barely have a third of Americans say that that things like patriotism, religion, having children, community involvement are important. And and there's one last point that's money. And we're going to get into that as well today. I mean, it, it, it's it's just kind of crazy. And, and I'll, I'll end with this, and then we're going to start getting into each yeah. one of these points. The last paragraph um, for this segment says, The share of Americans who say that having children, involvement in their community, and hard work are very important values have also fallen. Tolerance for others, deemed very important by 80% of Americans as recently as four years ago, has fallen to 58% since then. Okay, so my first thoughts in a one-liner is... This is a damning indictment of the current state of American society in 2023. Well, Your I, thoughts? I, I don't. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I do think one of the things. I, one of the things I want to throw out there right away because people are always going to ask this because, for good reason, people have stopped trusting a lot of polls and they feel like they're designed to. to they're, they're not designed to inform us about what is as much as they are to manipulate us into believing things. So I, I'm going to, I'm actually, I've actually got the actual poll up. I'm just going to look at some real quick, just to show you out of the people that respond to this poll, 23% identified as being liberal on, on some spectrum of liberal, right? 47% said moderate, 28% said conservative. Um, and then when you look at the age range, cause I think this is really important. The age range was, uh, 18 to 34 was about, uh, 29, 35 to 49, 25, 50 to 64, 25, 65 plus 22. So they've got a good sampling of the various age ranges, people at various stages of life. And then about uh, 49% male, 51% female. And then when you look at the uh, ethnicity status, it, it pretty much matches the demographics that we see within the country. It's probably a little bit lower on Hispanic. Uh, but it's 62% white, 12% black, 17% Hispanic, 9% other. And then a marital status, it was 50-50. 50% of the respondents were married, 50% not married. So the reason why I point this out is that from an ideological perspective and also from kind of a general like lived experience perspective, they they have a... They, they have a sampling size. It's over a thousand people, which anybody that knows anything about polling knows that that's a decent size poll. And they've got it. They've got a, so a good sampling size and that sampling size kind of reflects what we would consider to be the age, uh, perhaps like ideological race, you know, and, and then, you know, sex differences within the United States. So here's, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to take this. There, there was five categories that really got mentioned, right? It was patriotism, religion, having children, community involvement, and money. And so we're going to go through each one of these, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the numbers were in 98 versus what they are now and why we think it happened for that particular category. So patriotism. Patriotism was at, you know, comfortably over 60% in 1998, and it nosed So it was generally going down all the way till, till 2019 and then nosedive, basically COVID hits. What happened? I was about to, you <laughs> spoiled it. I was about COVID to be like, hits. what happened after 2019? Right. And there's, a, there's a general nosedive in, in patriotism. And I, I was listening to somebody talk about this and she, she was younger. I wanted, I think it was, I think it was Isabel. Um, she was talking about this and, and she brought up an interesting point that I'd like to get you guys to take on. She said, look, before you start saying, well, kids these days, because it's, it's largely younger respondents that, that have, you know, lower patriotism levels. She goes, stop thinking about the America. Like if, if you're 35 plus, if you're 40 plus, stop thinking about the America you grew up in 
and start thinking about the America the 20-year-old grew up in. It, it, th- th- that's really important because consider a somebody that is 23. Yeah. They weren't even alive when this first poll was actually um, held back in 1998. Right. Yeah. So so back in 1998, when you had 70% of Americans say that patriotism was important to them and and 62% said that religion was important to them, the average 23 year old today, not the average, all 23 year olds today, they weren't even born yet. They weren't even yeah. conceived yet. Yeah. So so the, the environment that somebody like I, to give you an idea, like I was four in 19. My my first memory yeah. was from 1998. It was either 1998 or 1997. I can't exactly remember. But like so, so just keep that in mind. We've had an entire generation pass since then. And the mood of the country in 1998 was a lot different. I mean, not that I necessarily remember it vividly, yeah. right? But like it was a lot different than it is today. We had just won the Cold War. The economy was booming. We were at the height of the dot-com, dot-com bubble. bubble. Like it, it, everything was going swimmingly by all accounts. Yeah. And maybe I'm looking at it with a little bit of nostalgia, right? But but like compare that to the 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 view that people have of today it's it's just pessimism well, i mean i say this as the ultimate pessimist yeah. right but like it's just pessimism all around well if you if you were born in 2000 right i was born in 1979 right but if you were you were, or as or as or as young people like to say oh the the late 19th century <laughs> <laughs> or the late 20th century sorry late 20th century um if you were born in in 2000 uh 2000 you're now you know maybe you're 22 23 years old and in, in your lifetime, 9-11 happened, the housing collapse happened. Um, we just had the, the late, we had COVID happen. We've had, um, you know, massive inflation, inflation that we haven't seen in the United States in a long time. Um, there, there's all kinds of, of problems that have had at the same time that culturally there's also been a shift with respect to how we explain a lot of these things from taking place and what we believe the proposed solutions are. And, and so if you're, if you're 20, 23 years old right now, you've actually gone through your fair share of various global crises, a global pandemic, wars. I mean, let me I tell mean, you, I'm sick and tired of living through what is now the fourth once in a lifetime economic crisis. Yeah. And I'm not even 30. yet. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I, so I think when we look at the, the patriotism level, um, it, it's a combination of two things. One if you're young and you're looking at what your parents were able to do um, growing up in the 90s or early 2000s, you, your your view of what's possible financially has, has probably gone down significantly. I mean, we, we've all seen the reports where more and more kids are, are you know, staying at home, uh, not to mention the fact that they might be drowning in college debt. And, and again, before we look at that, and again, I've been very, very harsh on the whole idea of, quote, forgiving student loans, because you can't forgive a government infused in student loan. All you can do yeah. is transfer it on to other people. But if if you were one of those kids that worked really hard getting straight A's all throughout, you know, high school, and you were told that as long as you get a college degree, you're going to make six figures. And then all of a sudden you end up with six figures in debt and you can't make more than $40,000 a year. You, you're going to feel betrayed at yep. the same time. There's war at the same time prices are going. So when you ask somebody that that's been their, their primary experience, then of course they're not going to be optimistic about the future, right? It is an unreasonable expectation for us to look at them and to say, well, look at what's going on in the rest of the world when they're saying, okay, but I'm, I'm comparing what's going on in my country 20 years ago from what's going on right now, and I'm not optimistic about it. Yeah, I might be able to, if I'm being really intellectually honest, I might be able to accept the fact that, yes, I probably got it better in the United States than I would almost anywhere else in the world but well, it's still not better than it well, was 20 years we're, ago. We're, we're going to get into that because there's also stuff from this poll that shows yeah. a huge number of Americans don't believe that the best of the best is in the United States. Well, I, I just I think when we get into the why on, on the patriotism, especially with younger people, I think before we before we start casting stones, it's important to understand that that they're, you know, the, the new favorite word kind of like lived experience even though it's probably significantly better from historical standards than the vast majority of people, you know, born in the past or born now, there, there's still been, there's been a lot of gut punches. Yeah. Right. Yep. There's yeah. been a lot of, there's been a lot of failed. Now, what I think is dangerous about this, and we'll get into this later, is the whole idea of what are they running to for solutions and what are they being told the solutions and perhaps even most importantly, what are they being told are the root causes of it? Because I think they're being lied to, but let's, well, they, 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 they that explains why you're seeing the disintegration of so many of these different values because other it's it's not that Nietzsche was not right 
right? Yeah. What, what, what's replacing this is not nothing. It's yeah. it's not the believing in the in the Ubermensch that's going to conquer yeah. the world. Will to pa- none of that's happening. Instead, what's happening is is that we're seeing like a balkanization of values, right? You're you're seeing a fragmentation of values where people are are jumping into different things, yeah. and you ultimately you can't have a country without a shared set of of something to unify people historically that's either been a religion or a language but usually and especially in the modern age it's been a shared set of values and cultures that transcend people's ethnicity or skin color or religion and and that was considered i mean margaret thatcher was famous for saying that europe was created by history america was created by philosophy and, and one of the things that and I so was, what happens when the philosophy disintegrates? There you go. Like, why would I? If if your country is built off of philosophy and the and the the central idea behind it, even if it's founding, if, even though we we all recognize it hasn't been perfectly carried out, right? Like we get that. But when when the statement said all men are created equal and entitled, you know, by their creators, certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and and uh, the pursuit of happiness, and when people from all over the world. Right, regardless of what was going on in this country, still saw it as the land of a genuine opportunity where one generation, two generations, three generations, and, and, and oh, by the way, pe- to this day, if you're living somewhere else and you come to the United States with that mindset and with that attitude, yes, you are going to end up being far more prosperous and successful in the United States than you probably would anywhere else in the world. Right. So the mentality still works. The philosophy still works. The difference is, is that over, especially over the last several decades, but two in particular, we've doubled down on this theory that no, 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 that was never the American philosophy. That was never American. The idea, it was all white supremacy. It was all racism. It was all higher, you know, structures of power and hierarchy. So now at the same time that you have bad things happening, right? Some of it, you can chalk up to policy. Some of it, you can chalk up to just, you know, just various events. There, there's no longer this faith in, yeah, it's bad right now, but the fundamentals are true. And if we just stick to it and we work harder, then we can work through this challenge. We're not telling them that. We're, we're telling them that everything's horrible. And by the way, it deserves to be horrible because our whole system is bad and corrupt. And the only way we're going to change it is if we overthrow it. If someone has grown up experiencing what they're experiencing while at the same time being fed that narrative from an early age, we, we should have, I'm sorry, we have zero right to expect patriotism especially from younger Americans, if that's what they've grown up with. So let, we, let's move on. Let's move on to this next one. Go, go back up. Um, I want to see the larger graph there. Um, okay, religion. Religion is another one that is, is dropped off significantly. And this is, this is interesting to a point because you would think with something like a global pandemic or a crisis that you might actually see an uptick. Um, in, in, and, and I'm not saying that I, again, I'm I'm a religious person. I'm a dedicated Christian. I don't see religion as a crutch, right? But there, there's this there's this popular social mindset that well, that it is a crutch. When bad things happen, people run people run to God. They run to something transcendent that can explain what's going on in the world. I I think there's two reasons for this. I'd like to get your guys's take on it. In the United States, I think there's two reasons. One, when the pandemic struck, a lot of the churches, quite frankly, just didn't step up. And, and really provide what they should have provided in a time of crisis was the meeting of both, not just spiritual and emotional, but also physical needs. It's this, this, this mindset that, that started in the 1920s in the United States, but has really come to fruition that when something goes bad, it's not the church's responsibility to do anything. They just give thoughts and prayers, right? And I'm not saying that derogatory. I think, I think prayer is powerful. But God didn't call us to just pray. He called us to be physically active, Within right. our world, and when I think, and a lot of churches failed to step up. So in one case, it, it, I think, to a lot of Americans, it felt like, "What are you here for?" The government said, "Shut down," and you shut down. Right. And then on the second side, the, the, I, I mean, about half the church. It feels like I, I don't have specific numbers. It feels like about half the church has decided that they're more interested in shifting the church, church's beliefs over to whatever they find is currently popular than actually standing as a, a bulwark to say, no, we believe this is truth no matter what the world says. And, and the bottom line is that if your, church is, if your church isn't going to stand on what they believe to be as truth, well, then what's the point? It's just another self-help fad. And when you don't find it helpful, you leave. Why would you believe in it if it's not the truth or if it's just your own truth? And, and I feel like a, a significant portion of the Christian church in the United States no longer stands on, their, on any sort of core beliefs. I've said for a long time that I believe that the Christian church and churches in general have given the government their own responsibility and allowed yes. them to do the job that they've been called to. 
Yeah, they've rendered to Caesar things that didn't belong to Caesar, right. and lo and behold, Caesar right. has screwed it up. And Caesar is increasingly asking the question, hey, why are you here anyways? All you're doing is competing for money and worship, and the government doesn't like to compete for money and yeah. worship. It demands all of it. And, and so I, I honestly think that one of the reasons why we've seen a drop-off in religion is not because the church has failed to keep up with social trends, but the church has elevated social trends above what they used to call universal and transcendental truths. Why would you go out and help someone in the community when you know that they're getting a stimulus check? Yeah. Well, it's not, you paid taxes. That was mm -hmm. your contribution. Yeah. I just have to elect better people to distribute the money, you know, in a way that I think is, is more conducive to my goals. It's not my responsibility. It's somebody else's responsibility. Love thy neighbor. Didn't I do that with my tax dollars? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right? literally what, what is going on. I mean, I used to say that one of the reasons why, you know, so many Christians, so many people who profess to be believers um, still vote on the left and tend toward a socialist mindset is because of the charity aspect, because they think they can delegate their charity over to government. But unfortunately, the point of charity and the point of doing those things is to give you credibility to be able to point back to Christ and give God the glory. And if you aren't, um, you know, you're getting it from a government entity the glory goes to the government. Gl glory goes to the politicians that are all too happy to take it. And, um, and, and now they're elevated to a different status and you've lost your opportunity for the gospel. And I understand a lot of folks watching may not be Christians, but that's just, that's the way I see it as a Christian. Well, and charity by definition is voluntary. Can I, the, the government, this is a very important point to make before we go on here okay. because <laughs> The government does not engage in charitable giving. The government engages in confiscation and redistribution. Now, if you would like to make an argument that there's times where that's appropriate, that's fine. And I think that I think you can make a credible argument. But you don't get to call it charity. You, you, don't, you don't get to call it that. Charity by necessity requires voluntary action, not coercion. And the government doesn't engage in that sort of voluntary action. They engage in coercion. So I, I, I want to move forward with this article just a little bit because... I, I heard some pr pretty interesting theories about what's happening. I have one myself, but it's kind of going to lead into what we're about to read through. So, so I'm going to hold that off for just a second. Um, the Wall Street Journal article goes on to say that um, Bill McInturf, a pollster who worked on a previous journal survey that measured these attitudes along with N uh, NBC News, said that, quote, these differences are so dramatic, it paints a new and surprising portrait of a changing America, end quote. He surmised that perhaps the toll of our political division, COVID, and the lowest economic confidence in decades is having a startling effect on our core values. The number of events have sh um, a number of events have shaken and in some ways fractured the, na um, the nation since the journal first asked about unifying values. Among them, September 11th, 2001, which, by the way, was so far past that somebody that was born 20 years ago literally wasn't even alive when yeah. September 11th happened. Yeah. Um, terrorist attacks, the financial crisis of 2008, and subsequent economic downturn, and the rise of former President Donald Trump. This is actually kind of important because I, I, my, my theory that I had kind of shoots down this idea that, oh, the reason this all happened was because of Trump. Yeah. No, Trump is a symptom of something. He's not the cause of something. It's you, People are conflating cause and effect here. Um, well, can I, can I say something really? Because yeah, I've, I've had go personal ahead. experiences with before where I, I've, I've sat in the chamber in the Virginia House of Delegates where we, we were discussing very weighty issues, you know, emotionally charged issues. And it was perfectly acceptable for the other side to come down on the floor and compare us to Nazis and segregationists and to call us bigots and to call us sexists and all of these things. And we were expected to view that from the lens of, they're just really, they're really empathetic. They're very passionate they're about really their issue. They're really sincere in their they're anger. They're really sincere. And I'll, I'll, yeah. that's actually a good they're point. They're speaking right? truth to power. They're, 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 well, they're just speaking their truth, and we should understand that that's, it, it comes from a position of caring. Well, I got up, <laughs> and, and I said, I gave a defense for what I cared about and why I thought it was important and why I thought their solution wasn't good. They got up and left the floor, like they, in tears. Like I had, I had one, I had one person come over to me who's actually a friend of mine on the other side of the aisle, come up and say, you know, I'm sorry you're such an angry person. I'm like, wait a second. Why, why is it that when you guys get up and call us all these mean, horrible things, I said, if you go back and look at my speech, I didn't even directly accuse you. I didn't, I didn't question your intentions. I, I questioned your policies and I defended our intentions and policies, but that makes me angry and it makes you passionate. I said, that, that's not a fair comparison. 
And and she she looked at me and she goes, "Well, I don't appreciate that you brought this point up. That person was just speaking from from a a, a point of passion." I said, "Oh, oh, okay. Well, then everything I said was also from a point of passion, so it's fine now, right? You're okay with everything I said because I just explained what, it." What did they say to that? She actually looked at me and she goes, "I see your point." Because she's the one thing I, I love about this person, the General Assembly. We don't agree on politics. Um, I know who this person is. And she's is. not coming back. She's yeah, not coming she's back. Not coming but back, unfortunately. But she's, she's, intellectually, she, she's intellectually consistent. She will have a, a good faith conversation with you. But the reason why— A I, rare I, and dying breed, I might point But the reason I point this out is because it's so easy to point at Donald Trump and say, well, well, he's the issue because, yeah, D- Donald Trump would fight back. Mm-hmm. And, and I, to this day, I've had people come up and go, well, Nick, the problem with you is that when we hear you talk, you're always like coming after us. And why do you have to do that? Why can't, I'm like, are, are you, <laughs> I said, go back and look at every speech I've given. It's, oh, it's almost always in response to something you have just said, something you have just accused us of. It's like, I, I, I hate to put it this way, but it's like the moment you get a taste of your own medicine, you don't like it. And you immediately mm-hmm. want to categorize yourself as the victim in the exchange and but that's not fair. I'm like, sorry, if you want respect, it needs to be reciprocated. That's why, the, I mean, honestly, the Democrats have a long history of not liking anybody they're oppressing or or attacking to be able to fight back. Look at abortion. Look at slavery. <laughs> this is why so, Tina's on the show. Yeah. This is why, you know, it's funny. They were nervous about going live because I might say something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm waiting for the flood of comments to be like, Tina needs to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> double down. Um, so uh, I actually, we'll get into some of the hyper partisanship um, because we're about to get into the breakdown of this poll by party. Yeah. And that has some really interesting implications. And that also gets into my theory of what I think is going on here. Um, so the, the article says that, um, the, and this is like really cynical, the only priority the journal tested that has grown in importance in the past quarter century is money, which has been cited as very important by 43% in the new survey up from 31% in 1998. Aside from money, all age groups, including seniors, this is important because they were alive in 1998. Yeah. Um, attached far less importance to these priorities and values than when pollsters asked about them in 1998 and 2019. But younger Americans in particular place low importance on these values, many of which were central to the lives of their parents. I want to say one thing about the money. I actually did some math. I wrote this in a Facebook post, and it's really depressing. The math that I did, um, I, I wrote this a couple months ago, so it's not 1998, it was 1996, but it's close enough. And here's what I said. I said, in 1996, a person making $36,000 put them at the 50th percentile. That's as middle of the road as you can possibly get. That's the the little definition of the middle class, right? Due to inflation, $36,000 in 1996 is now the equivalent of $68,000 today. In 2023, a person making $68,000 is not at the 50th percentile. They are at the 68th percentile. Mm which is why it feels like it's so much harder to get ahead than it was for your parents. Yeah. Because it has. Well, and I think that's important. So it, go back up to the graph real quick because let's look at the – because there's five categories. Before you say that, can I do this in reverse? Yeah. In reverse, a person making $47,000 today is at the 50th percentile for income. Yeah. $47,000 today is the equivalent of 24000 in 1996. Yeah. If you were making $24,000 in 1996, you were not at the 50th percentile. You were at the 34th percentile. Well, and this comes up to a good point that you made earlier when we were discussing this. And this is like, it would be really easy to say, oh, well, okay, patriotism's down, religion's down, but the, the desire for money is up. It's an increase in materialism. And I actually think you can make some arguments for that. But the, the argument you brought up and the Tina brought up was also, well, okay, wait a second. When you're taking a poll at a time when inflation's really high, prices are going high, people don't feel as, as confident with respect to the, their current economic status nor the economic future, of course money's going to rank higher in their overall concerns of importance because it, it turns out it's the primary way that we buy food and shelter and clothing. And, well, they're everything. making less money at the same time. Everything costs more. Everything costs more and exactly. interest rates have gone up, but they're also making less money by a pretty hefty amount. Well, well no, no, no. It's, 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 that, it's that people are making more money. It's that the value of power. their money has degraded. Yeah. That, that's why you get situations where people are like, I make $100,000 a year and I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Well, so first off, your $100,000 a year was $50,000. 25 years ago yeah. and right. which is still not 
ultra well. We view that as ultra wealthy today, but they would not yeah. have viewed that as ultra wealthy a, a, a generation ago. And and not you only that, you would have been comfortable. That you would have yeah. been comfortable. Not only that, but but you're living paycheck to paycheck. Well, why are you living paycheck to paycheck? Be well, I don't know. Maybe it's because we printed seven trillion dollars in one year in 2020. This is this is an all. This is also a part where because because economics is I don't think well understood by a lot of people, like basic principles of economics, supply and demand issues, the, the, the role that prices actually pay in a market economy, as opposed to people just believing there's something that the business owner just sticks, oh, I want to make this much on this product. Here's the price. That's not how this works. The other thing that's a problem is people genuinely misunderstand, and, and that's because they've been lied to about what inflation is. So to Christian's point, you can make more money and have less purchasing power and less standard of living. How, it, how is that possible? And like, oh, it's because of greedy corporations, because look, they're getting much. Can I, can I explain something? Two things can be true at once. It can be true that a lot of board members and super wealthy people are getting wealthier at the time that, the, that poor people are not getting wealthier at even close to the same pace. The question is, is that you don't get to look back at the 50s and say, oh, well, that was because we had more government intervention in the economy at that point, or we had higher taxes. That No, that does not explain it. It just does not explain it when you go back and look at the data. What does explain it is inflationary monetary policy. Because if, if, you're, if your net worth and your value is in the stock market, and you know how to play inflationary monetary policy within the stock market, then your value can go up exponentially. But if you're someone that is, let's say you've got a retirement account, you're not living paycheck to paycheck, but by the same token, you're, you're not going out and buying a yacht because you feel like it, right? If you're on that level, inflation affects you at a rate far worse than it affects people that actually know how to manipulate the marketplace and manipulate the stock market. And, and so, all these people saying that, well, this is a problem with greed. Okay, maybe, but it, you're going to have to look at the greed of the government. You're going to have to look at the greed of the Federal Reserve. No company has have to look at the of greed. greed that can compete yeah. with the greed of the Federal Reserve and the federal government. Yeah, so it, it, but I understand why people are I, – I can understand a practical explanation why, why when asked this question, people are saying that you know, if, if they've been told – that they're the the founding ideals of the United States are actually rooted in racism, bigotry, and and you know hierarchies of power designed to you know hurt minority populations. Well, obviously you're not going to be patriotic about that. If at the same time your 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 church shut down during COVID and has now adopted a theology which is just rooted in trying to be you know cool for the kids as opposed to actually providing something of concrete you know knowledge and truth and power, um, and and then at the same time everything costs more. Well then, yeah, you're 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 going to be disillusioned about your country and its history. You're going to be disillusioned about you know faith and religious institutions, and you're going to be very very focused on trying to be able to make enough to support your family. Yeah, right. That that is not an unreasonable conclusion that somebody would come to. So, the, Christian, I've got a quick question. Just a second ago, you said that no company's greed would compete with the Federal Reserve or the federal government. Mm -hmm. Can you go talk about that for a second? That's fascinating. <sighs> I mean, at the end of the day, a company has to make its money by offering goods and sir even if it's even if it's if, if it's the most evil corporation on earth i i have a very negative view of 99 percent of the companies in silicon valley very negative view of them but at the end of the day are those companies threatening me with the use of force and imprisonment are they sending guys with guns to my house if i don't fork over money to them no instead they're offering a product that i willingly choose to purchase yeah. when i use apple when i when i when I use Facebook, when I use, well, I, I, Facebook, they just sell my data, right? But I willingly choose to use Facebook, right? I willingly choose to use Microsoft products when I write papers or I do research for this show. So like those companies, yes, a lot of them, their values do not align with mine. But at the end of the day, they don't have the ability to send guys with machine guns to my house to force me to fork over money to them. The federal government does. That's why I fear the government more than I do the private sector. Well, and I especially fear the merging of those two together, as we've seen increasingly. I, I've heard I've heard somebody sum it up once before. They're like, if Bill Gates showed up to your door and demanded that you do something, you would tell him to get the F off your porch. If an IR, if a 22-year-old IRS agent that with no life experience and, and no individual wealth and like showed up to your door and asked to see your documents. You'd be terrified. You'd be terrified. I, I mean, that's that's the power differential that's really at play here between a, a institution that at the end of the day might have a lot of money, might have a lot of influence, but 
still can't force right. you to do anything versus one that can put you in jail or take your stuff if you don't comply. And the idea is that the federal government and state governments are supposed to be providing certain services or providing certain security uh, aspects. And right now you have a massive decline in the quality of the product they're providing. Yeah. And because it's the government, it, it pays no price for being wrong. Um, you've got people that get reelected um, and you can change out who's in there, but can you change the bureaucrats that are running the place? They just wait out the politician. And so you're getting a worse product for more money and uh, at, with more risk involved. Okay. Tina kind of said a thing that I, I'm, I'm just going to have to jump into. I, I was I wanted to hold off my theory of what's going yeah. on here with the complete collapse and all those categories that we were talking about you know, having children, patriotism, religion, all these, all these, so, all so, these cultural so far, institutions. So far we've hit patriotism, religion, and money. We mm -hmm. have two more to go. So looking at these institutions, my theory, and this kind of gets into a little bit of what Tina was saying. I, I wrote this to a friend. Um, and so I pasted it here so I could just read it off. And I, I said that people say America is doomed because we have an entire political party in this country that hates their own nation and believes almost all public and private institutions that exist within it are intentionally designed to sustain oppressive power structures against that party's core demographics, and therefore, um, uh, or, so, sorry, uh, uh, sustain oppressive power structures for that part, you know, against that party's core demographics, um, and therefore those institutions need to be destroyed, dismantled, decolonized, slash insert whatever buzzword is popular here. Meanwhile, I'm not, ha I, 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 I'm kind of brutal to both sides here. I say, meanwhile, we have another political party that thinks those institutions have all been overtaken by the other side. And so they have not only lost all motivation to sustain or defend them, but they are now atta actively attacking them. As I pointed out above, that was from a longer conversation. The reason why this is the case is because we have a political party that believes all these institutions, they're racist, they're bigoted, they're homophobic, they're transphobic, they're oppressive, and they must be torn down. When you are constantly being told these institutions are all evil and you witness your political opposition take them over, as they have with the university system, for example, or the media or corporate America, you really start to lose interest in defending or even caring about them. The results of this poll of this article that we've been going through is extremely bleak. The conservative forces in society are supposed to be the bulwark of institutional preservation. And instead, they are simply abandoning the trenches because they no longer believe those institutions are worth fighting for. But this is such an abnormal development, and it deserves serious introspection that goes far beyond blaming Trump or some other media personality for how we got to this point. And my final paragraph is this. You cannot have a functioning society without a common bond and culture to hold people together. That culture has to emerge from something greater than yourself. We used to have in this country. We used to have it in this country, and we don't now. Everyone distrusts all public and private institutions, and for good reason. And nobody wants to interact with anyone outside of their immediate family or friend circle. And even there, we're seeing the nuclear family collapse at a breathtaking pace, and people are making fewer and fewer friends as well. We've had a whole podcast yeah. about why men are checking out right now. It's sad. This country has produced, for all of its flaws and imperfections, the best society in the world, in my opinion, and that society is in the process of disintegrating. And I, 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 I do think that at the end of the day, the reason that we're seeing all of these, these, these things that used to be held in such high esteem by everybody, by, by the overwhelming majority of Americans, I feel like the reason that they're falling off a cliff is because one side thinks these things are evil. Yeah. Patriotism, that's evil. Having kids, well, the climate is is out of control and we need to stop having kids. And why would you want to bring somebody into such a terrible world anyway? Well, unless they're renting what? uteruses. Religion? Women. Oh, well, religion's all bogus anyway. I believe in scientism and materialism and I'm an atheist. Like, like every single one of these points, you have one side that thinks they're either false or they're evil or they're part of oppressive power structures designed to, to you yeah. know, marginalized minority communities or, or whatever the group is, whatever the oppressed group is. So you have one side that actively hates these institutions and has tried to tear them down, which is really funny because they've also taken over these institutions. Yeah. And then you have another side of the political aisle, the conservative side, that by nature 
The purpose of conservatism in the Edmund Burke classical sense is to preserve these institutions against those who want to rip the fence post out of the ground without asking why it's been put there in the first place, to quote Thomas Sowell. But the irony, the twisted irony, is that the conservative forces that are supposed to be the bulwark of defending these institutions have abandoned aben uh, defending them because they look at these institutions and they say they've been hijacked by the radicals, the, the insane people are running the asylum. I don't care about these institutions anymore. I'm not going to bother defending them. So what happens when you have one side of the political aisle, half the country hates America's institutions and thinks they're evil, and the other half of the country looks at these institutions and says they're not worth fighting for anymore? No, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a fair point. And I think, scroll, scroll back up again to the, the graph, um, because I think this gets into the next, the next two things that we're going to talk about, and that is having children and community involvement. Like having children went from 60% as being very important in 1998, which I'll tell you, even at that stage is, is low, right? That, that's, not a, that's not a glorious number. It's not like we're looking to the good old days in 1998, but at least at that point, you, you didn't have any of the, you know, maybe you could argue excuses for it. And, and now it's, it's, you know, it's dipped like into the, what is it? The, I think the thirties or the high twenties, depending on the age range. Um, this is important for two reasons. One, if you take away, things like religion and patriotism. Because let, let's face it, patriotism is ultimately tied to a certain degree of optimism about the country that you live in. If you believe that the, the, the foundational roots of your society are basically good, um, then that's something to be proud of. And if that's something that you're proud of, then it, it's easy to be more optimistic about the future. By the same token, when it comes to your religion, religion is something that we've almost put up into this separate space where it's like, again, we don't talk about it. It used to be you don't talk about religion and politics. Everything is politics now, but religion is still supposed to stay. There's stave. only one side that's not allowed to talk about yeah. religion and politics. Yeah. Everybody else is in the clear. But but it's it's gotten to the point where everyone believes, you know, er everyone says that. And, and then with respect to religion, that's really been ostracized because if you're looking at this, you would expect that with the number of conservatives that are in this survey, religion would still score a little bit higher. Oh, can, uh, Hamilton, could you scroll down and show the breakdown by party? Well, here, I, I can. I don't don't scroll down right now. Okay. I can I can just bring it up right now, and I'll just I'll just read it off. When it when it comes to um, Democrat versus Republican, right? The the people that identified as Democrat, and that could be anything from lean to strong Democrat, forty four. Independent, 18, Republican, 38, right? So that, that was the breakdown by party. But then when you go into liberal versus conservative, it was liberal, 23 identified as liberal, 47 identified as moderate, 28 identified as conservative. So what's interesting here is, you, is that we're being told this is a 50-50 split, or not even a 50-50, it's 44 to 38, 44 Democrat, 38 um, Republican, 18 independent. But then you come down to liberal it's 23, conservative 28, moderate 47. The numbers don't quite we've got add the, up. We've got the crowd. I mean, it, this is, I mean, honestly, the, you want to talk about an ultimate black pill moment. 59% of Republicans say patriotism is important to them. I expect the left yeah. to not be patriots. Yeah. I mean, because literally, they're especially now, their entire narrative is the United States is an evil, racist yeah. country built on slavery okay, and okay. oppressing people. Hold on, though. Okay, so... Patriotism, you're looking at the Republicans. There is a segment of the Repub Republican population of people who identify as Republican, I guess you could say, who did not like the nationalism approach that was kind of um, became popular under Donald Trump and the MAGA people. And so because of that, because they're all being called patriots and, you know, you're patriotic and this and that, you have that what is that 40% of people 41% of of the republicans who are turned off by it now because of i think because of the stigma associated with it because some of these people don't like trump well there, there's a populism and so, component and so the patriotism it's just like um the tea party folks were sort of painted as being the kooks of the party and patriot was a big deal within tea party the Tea Party movement. And so I think the word patriotism, um, if you were to word that differently, you know, um, something like love of your own, your, your country or, you know, believing in your country, they might, that number might've looked different, but I think the word patriotism and patriot 
have a negative connotation with a certain segment of the population, even within the Republican Party, because there are Republicans who did not like that, who are on the more moderate side. Well, I think there, I think there also used to be more of a distinction between the political parties. And this would, this really came to fruition, or this really came to the forefront when Michelle Obama said, for the first time in my adult life, I'm proud of my country. And Republicans really kind of rebelled at that. It was this idea that No, no, I'm proud of my country. I may not like my government. I may not like the politicians, but I'm always proud of my country. That used to be kind of a a, a common Republican understanding of patriotism, whereas I do believe that Democrats, at least earlier on, (coughs) excuse me, later on um, through Democrats, started to more closely tie their their pride in, in country with whether or not their side was in power. And I think that now that's almost completely, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if, it, if in the next 10 years, if the number for Democrats that describe themselves as patriot is almost exclusively tied to whether or not their party is in control. That's true. All right. Whereas we're starting to see that take hold more now within the Republican side as well. I know. I mean, most so of us are I, devastated to see the direction it's going. Yeah. And well, but this is also, and, and this is, we, we've got to get to these two other points, right? The other one has to do with having children, right? So only 38% of, re, of identified Republicans consider having children to be a high priority. Now, I, I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. There's a lot of people that have been arguing, we've seen this with the climate change, right? Like the world doesn't need more of your genes. The ideal population for the entire world should only be 500 million. You see this with, with, you know, people in the WEF, it's this Malthusian idea that the world is so heavily overpopulated that we're, we're running ourselves toward extinction. And what the world really needs is about for the population to be cut by about 80%. Now it's never them, right? They're going to, they're going to cut other people. But if that mindset takes hold where you see human beings as a virus on the planet, and the reason why I bring this up is this is different people for years have put off having children because of financial considerations. They put off having children because they wanted to accomplish certain things within their life before they started having kids because they knew that when they had kids, that ends up becoming the the dominant priority. But when you make it a moral referendum to not have children, at, at the same time that within certain sectors of the left, and and I'm sorry, but if anybody comes on and says, prove it, I'm going to tell you you're insane. When certain, not all, but certain elements within the left say that you need to shout your abortion because having an abortion is actually a demonstration of female empowerment. We we shouldn't be terribly surprised that having children drops off as as a significant goal, not just because of of the potential economic factors, um, not just because people are looking at the world and saying with everything that's going on in our schools and with everything, like the the conservative argument for not having children is things are going so bad. I don't want to raise kids in this mess because I don't want to expose them to it. For for the left, it's I don't want to have kids because kids are a positive impediment on the, the well-being of the planet. I, I don't think that's the only and, reason. Well, wait, I'm, I'm not done. Okay. And then the third component is th- this kind of like replacing the moral values that you see provided in most major world religions, which are rooted in the idea that there is a God, there is objective truth, there is uh, objective morality, and you have certain obligations as being part of this created order to, no, there's none of that, right? There's no objective truth. There's no objective morality. You're going to live your life and then you're going to die and you're nothing but a bag of water that responds to stimuli. So, hey, have as many good stimuli responses as possible until you leave this planet and I mean, so you you have you have moral reasons on both or or pretend moral reasons on both sides to not have kids, whether it's because you think it's going to be too tough on them or whether you think it's because it destroys the planet. But then you also have this hedonism replacing what used to be objective truth and morality, telling you that, no, it is all about you and kids are going to take away from you being able to achieve all of your self-actualization. That's exactly the point I was going to make is is that uh, right now what we see, one of the reasons why having children is probably on the back burner for people is because of the financial side. But also we have a prolonged adolescence now. Yeah. I mean, people aren't leaving their parents' home um, Permanently, like they may go back and forth, but they're always springboarding back, you know, going back to mom and dad's place. Um, And they don't actually launch now. And the average is like 26 now to finally launch. Well, I mean, if you look at your best fertility years, I mean, you're missing it. You're 
at some point you're missing it. It used to be considered that after 30, you're a higher risk pregnancy and you are, you're a much higher risk for, you know, all kinds of birth defects. And it's not that any of that has changed. Those complications still exist and the higher birth defects rates and things like that still exist. It's just, they don't talk about it as much anymore because what is the number one point in, in everyone's existence and that is to please themselves and to do everything for themselves. I mean, you even have people who are opting not to have children because then they wouldn't be the children. Yeah. I mean, they there is this self-gratifying urge within this current po- population and I think that it's always been there. I think that's sinful nature, but I think there has always been a moral component that kept it in check yeah. and helped people like ground themselves and put their feet back on the earth and 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 recognize the that there's more to life than just themselves. But, but I mean, people have become their own gods on this thing. And, you know, you talk about people not wanting to have children and that the, the environmentalists and everything like that, uh, they're making it, you know, appear that you're doing a disservice to the environment because of that. But those are the exact same people who are renting uteruses from women in order to adopt them, the baby out or surrogate the baby to uh, people who cannot, and I'm not talking about men and women who cannot have kids because of a medical issue. We're talking about uh, men who want to be fathers together with their other, with their male spouse. You're talking about, you know, trans people who cannot have children. So they rent a uterus from somebody. And there's, there's no shortage of women who are willing, who are advocates and allies to rent them out. And so what's interesting to me is this weird paradox that they live in where their entire mindset is so hypocritical that it's amazing to me that they can even function. And so I think that the, between the parties and between the, the um, ideological, you know, segments of the population, everybody probably has a different reason for putting children at the bottom of the list. But I, I also think I just, I think people have become their own gods Yeah. at no, this what, point. What, what, what I think is so interesting, Tina, is I think my gener- my parents' generation saw that divorce was a significant issue, and they told their kids, make sure you marry the right person, don't rush, yeah. wait till you find that right person and be sure. And that's good advice. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But how did we get to the point as a society where we took that advice and instead of waiting and doing what we needed to be doing all along the way, we decided, oh, well, I'm going to use this time to go have fun. Huh. Like, how did we get to that point? Well, I think that's the natural inclination. Well, the I, whole college experience is like yeah. a resort and you're supposed to go and sow your wild oats and have all your fun and do the frat stuff. You know? Well, I, I yeah, there's one. And let's, let's get to the, let's get to the fifth one here because we need to get into the, the last part of this, which is talking about what we can actually do about it. Because it, 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 as pessimistic as this is, yeah, I think there's something we can do about it. You want to read off the the survey results about people who think whether or not America is the greatest country in the world? Well, I want to get to the community involvement. I want to get to community involvement. It's we only can, one paragraph. I want to get to community involvement, and then we'll we'll hit that part here, right? Because it, the community involved. These are the five categories. Okay. What we're seeing here is that community involvement is is dropped off significantly, and you would probably expect it among Republicans because. If you told a Republican what is, or a conservative in general, what is community involvement, they probably would have said something around their church. Right. Well, if if religious affiliation and church attendance goes down significantly, their desire for community involvement probably goes down, combined with a lot of community involvement right now, I think, is associated with political activism. It's Mm. marching and something. Do you think the left might, when they hear community involvement, they think of political activism, and when the right hears that, they think of church or volunteerism? No, I think think the the right used to think of it as maybe like the Elks Lodge or Uh. the VFW, the American Legion, or the church. I think the left primarily thought of it as maybe like social programs within your community, um, food banks maybe, or like the arts and theater. Uh, But there, there was... There was, I think there's always been more of an activist approach from the left on community involvement, and there's been more of a social component on the right. Well, when you have COVID and, and all of a sudden church attendance is going down and, and walk into, this is a big problem that we see because I'm a member of the VFW, I'm a member of the American Legion. It is very tough for them to actually get newer, younger members involved in it. They don't, they don't associate the community around these, these institutions. So the institutions that used to be represent community values to the right 
right. are, are diminishing or getting older and, and not as becoming as relevant within their lives at the same time that I think both sides are starting to see community involvement as a, as a political activism component. Um, and, and that's why I think you see it. Which a, a is major really unfortunate. Off. Yeah. I have a friend, my former boss, actually, who's a Shriner. Yeah. He's your age. Um, mm-hmm. And he jokes about how, well, I bring the average age of Shriners down by at least 20 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it is in his local club. And like yeah. he's he's worried that in 10 years he'll be the only member left. Well, and it's I think part of the problem, too, is that community involvement used to be like, like <laughs> the Elks. People don't know this. The Elks Lodge, the Lions, the Masons, the whatever. Those community organizations used to provide local charity work. They mm-hmm. used to provide uh, actually they used to band together and be able to provide things like health insurance for their members. Right. They were organizations that came together that were not politically motivated they were community oriented right and they would address issues within their community and they would achieve them through voluntary cooperation charity and engagement well the more they became politically oriented the more they became divisive and the more people didn't want to be associated with what, them. what did that transition look like between being community oriented and then politically oriented I, I think as the government became more and more responsible for taking over community programs the more those institutions started looking toward the government to right. lobby for things either money laws rules regulations whatever it was now i'm not making it i'm making a very generalized sure, statement sure. right now i don't think that the vfw the Amer- however the AARP is a perfect example of this. AARP used to be an organization that would advise seniors on, on how to age and different benefits. And then it became significantly about Obamacare and healthcare yeah. and these different. So all, all of a sudden there's now a political ideology dominating the leadership within these institutions, which by definition alienates other people within the organization. And why do I want to be involved in that? And then the more the government takes over this role, the more this becomes political by nature, by default. And so I'm not spending my time with another political activist group organization. I'm not giving more money to another group that is going to spend half of it to lobby the government to do stuff when what I really wanted was to just be involved in helping my local community. Right. And and that's that's and and even at the local government level, right? It used to be that the Elks just did it cuz the Elks, and and they still do. Please understand, a lot of yeah. these organizations still do very great work, very great charitable work. But even then I see more and more groups where it's like, "Oh, well we've got to talk to our congressperson or our state legislator." or our town council, or our board of supervisors. Like, why? Why don't you just do it? Yeah. Just go do it. Nope. It, it's It's got to that, be political. That's an interesting oh, statement what? coming from an elected official. <laughs> okay, yeah. hold on, though. Hold on. Because I don't. I want to clarify this real quick. People do call, like, their state delegate and things like that in order to help them navigate the bureaucracy. Yes. And, and that's so totally that is constituent services all day yeah. long. That is a really good reason to call yeah. is if you're running into roadblocks because of all of our onerous regulation and, you know, bure- bureaucracy and just paper pushing. Yeah. Call yeah, call your state. Oh, believe me, no, help. no. I I mean, one of the things there's there's a lot about being in, in politics and specifically elected office that I don't particularly like. Um, but one of the things I do love is when somebody calls me up with a uh, with a problem that they've been facing with a bureaucracy for months at a time, and I get to pick up the phone and be like, "What the hell?" And then something gets done. I I, I like it because I'm able to help something. I'm also infuriated by it because it took me calling, and it shouldn't require that. But that's what happens. And and kind of as an aside. This is something I, I try to get people to to like think about. Um, a, a business, no matter how much you don't like the business or whatnot, a business still sees you as a customer. You're considered you're considered valuable to them. A government bureaucracy or or a government service generally sees you as a burden because they've got a set amount of money that they're spending on something, and the more people that are applying for it, the more competitive it gets it, with respect to trying to get those funds. They see you as a burden, not a customer, and that's always going to that's always going to affect. The, the customer service experience. But um, all right, let's, let's kind of, we, we've got on this Christian. Talk I want to ask bit you a question. I, I've talked too much. Part. I've got a question. One for of this you. last part. <laughs> um, the article goes on to say, and this is like super depressing. Yeah. Some 20, we hopefully we'll end on a good note. <laughs> but, um, it says that some 21% of the survey said that America stands above all other countries in the world, a view that some call American exceptionalism have said that America is one of the greatest countries along with some others. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. The share who said other countries are better than the U.S. rose up to 27, um, rose to 27%, up from 19% when the same question was asked in 2016. So what I get from this poll, this one segment of the poll, is that more people say 
that there's other countries that are better than the U.S. than, say, the U.S. is the greatest country in the world. Yeah. And then you've got half that are kind of in the middle that are trying to basically be like, well, does anybody really need to be the greatest? Yeah. I, I, what, what's your take on that? Okay, so th- there's some degree... There's some degree of maybe potential modesty here where it's like, well, look, I'm not, I don't want to brag, you know, my, I don't think that that's, but I don't think that's what's going on. I I think again, the United States, the, the, the kind of the, the singular word that has always been associated with the United States has been freedom. Okay. Freedom to do what? (laughs) Right. And it was, it was generally freedom to make your own way in the world. It was to be the author of your own story without some, you know, elite or the government or whatnot constantly standing in your way or interfering in that process. I think more and more people feel like that is not the case or increasingly becoming not the case. Not at the same time where most of our educational institutions are, are displaying a very, very negative view of the United States, our history and our motivations They're they're making in, in their, in their, um, Effort. Let's let's assign Nick, something positive. Nick, to that point, you want to read off this paragraph oh, from the, the university Mr. math Ms. teacher. Miss Riser said that Miss Riser, a university math teacher, she knows that other countries rank higher on tests and math performance. She said longer vacations and maternal leaves in some European countries mean that they have a better quality of life. In America, you basically have to work your whole life. You don't get breaks. She said. Go look at what the average wage is for a tenured college professor and tell me that they're just grinding away in the coal mines all day. Like this is this is so frustrating because what it does is it, it reassesses the idea of, of what makes a better quality of life. And, and it's this idea that a better quality of life is something that the government provides to you. Governments can create conditions. They, they can assist in the creation of conditions. Uh, but this idea that the government is somehow obligated to be able to create this this better quality of life with longer vacations and more maternal leave. You, you know what? The Soviet Union had long vacation days, long vacations, you, months of vacation time. That didn't mean you were better off. And the thing that, and, and to Christian's point, the other thing I would point out is whenever somebody says the United States is not the best country on earth, okay, what is? Which one is? Which one are you desperately trying to get into right now? Well, Nick, they, they, or, or they will say, they will say, well, why does there need to be a best country in the world? Or and, they'll, and they'll point and say, oh, well, in France, they have a lower retirement age. And, and so, so, what, so, what's the, I, so this I, is making the argument. So how do you respond? Well, to the, that? the argument I go back to is, OK, so if your if your idea of a if your idea of, of a better quality of life or a better country is one that provides a better retirement age, my question would be is if you think the government is providing that lower retirement age. Okay, and at what expense? What's the cost-benefit analysis? Why do you prefer that? And ultimately, aren't you relying on somebody else to be able to pay for your new experience? Or aren't you relying on somebody else to use coercion and force in order to engage in a system of redistribution, laws, rules, regulations, in order to give you the retirement date that you think would be more optimal? You know what the retirement age actually is? It's the age at which you have acquired the wealth necessary in order for you to retire and maintain the standard of living that you desire. Now, typically speaking, <laughs> countries which actually have free market economies, private property rights, where the government isn't constantly interfering in your way, they're the ones that actually provide the mechanism to realize that at, at a whole at a, at a variety of ages. The reason I brought that up, um, by the way, for the audience's reference, because there's so many new people that have tuned into the show recently and they don't necessarily know who we all are. Nick and I became friends in large part because I would bounce off when he was like first running for the House of Delegates um, or before he ran for the House of Delegates. And and when he was, you know, getting his feet wet in Richmond in the debate scene, one of the things that we would do all the time would be I would play the role of the leftist yeah. and I would like try to make the hardest argument and like put Nick in this like difficult situation and 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 then, put, you know, be like, well, what's your response to this? What's your response yeah. to that? And And like. One thing I've noticed is that when, when people point to the U.S., especially on the left, they do bring up some of these points that like, oh, well, these other countries have X or Y or Z. We, how many times have you heard that like Finland has the highest happiness rate in the world? How could yeah. you say America is the greatest country? Well, and, and that's interesting. They, they did this. It was funny because they came out one year and I think it was Denmark. They said Denmark had the, the highest happiness rating of anywhere on the earth. And see, and look, Denmark has, you know, more social welfare systems and Denmark has, you know, all these other things. Denmark also had like one of the higher suicide rates. And, and they found out that culturally it was inappropriate to complain about things in Denmark or, or to, so that, that's the problem with all of these factors is that you, you, you can manipulate any poll you want. You can nip, manipulate any policy you want to show it at any given time and say, oh, look, isn't this superior? The real question is, is what sort of society allows you the most freedom to be able to pursue happiness in accordance with 
your definition of it, not the government's definition of it, not this college professor's definition of it, not anybody else's definition. But if the only way you can achieve happiness is by setting up government systems which coerce and prevent me from achieving happiness, are you the good guy in this scenario? I don't think you are. I think you should be able to free to pursue things provided that you're willing to accept responsibility for your actions. That's what liberty is supposed to be. You are free to live your life in accordance with your values provided you don't infringe on the rights of other people. And what we're finding more and more is like, well, no, 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 we think it's better and we'll get better results if we do infringe on your rights. But look, we're achieving this greater collective goal. Well, well why is that better? Well, because democratically we've decided. Well, I got news for you. 50% plus one of the population can absolutely choose to oppress and steal from 50% minus 1% of the population. But what we find over time is that it doesn't work out for either side of the population very long. I, I want to go back to the whole retirement age situation. It's, it's really interesting to me that there is this idea out there that you're not allowed to retire until a certain age. No, you can retire whenever you want, provided that you have set yourself up to be able to do so. Now, it used to be that, I mean, right now, everyone looks to the government for retirement. You know, once once I'm eligible for Social, social Security, which it really isn't very much anyway, uh, you, you can then retire. Or once I'm eligible for my pension, I can retire. And every single one of these things depends on someone else to pull the trigger and let you do so. And what's interesting to me is that there is a correlation between this whole retirement idea and the family, marriage, and children idea. I think we are in this stage within our society, and, and I'm just kind of throwing this out here, where people don't have to value the relationships in their life. They don't have to maintain and value other people. So they don't have to treat their kids well. They don't have to treat their parents well because after all, the government's going to take care of them. They're not going to have to depend on these people for anything. And so um, it's it's just this idea that families are not close knit anymore. And in, in some in some areas, in some societies, it is very natural for you know, the parents to raise the kids and, and then the families to all stay together even after they're married and for them to take care of the, their elderly themselves with the children and be able to actually manage to stay together. Most people I talk to can't stand the idea of their parents or their in-laws having to stay with them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is a bridge too far. It's somebody's and I, responsibility, but definitely not there. Right, I and I wonder, like, ha have we denigrated our society so much? Have we devalued relationships so much that, you know, look, relationship takes work. There is no relationship in your life that is ever going to be puppy dogs and lollipops all the time. You have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn how to, like, let yourself just choose your battles and, and decide that you're not going to take offense over every little thing. And also to prop up and value other people. When you value other people, they end up value, valuing you. And so I feel like the tear down of the family is to blame again for this one as well. No, I agree. I, I, I they, there's, so there's, we're doomed. <laughs> so let, let's okay. So let's move on to what you. We're can not do doomed. About this. So, <laughs> Some so people might be. I'm those, really curious to hear what, yeah, what we, Tina and Hamilton have to say. And it, and, and actually, can we end with you because you're the host? <laughs> I, I, I well, think it's, you, it's more. It, it's more this idea on like uh, okay. We, we've gone through these five categories. We've explained what the poll had to say about them. We've talked about our, our ideas of, of why it is the way it is. The question is, is what do you do in response to all of this? Yeah. Because uh, there is a sense of learned helplessness, not just from the individuals that have bought into you know, the idea that who cares about faith, who cares about patriotism, who cares about having kids or anything. I just need to make as much money as I can to you know, uh, accomplish what, what I want for my own. You know, th that's it. And that's the height of individualism. It isn't. Um, that's the height of selfishness. You said, you said maybe, before, you, yeah, you said yeah, before we, we, we confuse selfishness with with individualism. Individualism is merely a concept which says that that inherent rights, uh, things like self interest, that it by necessity must start with the individual. There can't be such thing as a corporate right. It has to be because that's all made up of a group of individuals. So the rights have to start there. 
that, that's what individualism. Selfishness is, is I want what I want. I have an intense desire for, for wealth, pleasure, whatever it is, and I don't really care what I got to do to get it or how it affects other people as I do so it. So would you say that the results of the poll that we went through in, in this recording, well, live stream, would you say that that's more indicative of, of an increase in selfishness versus not necessarily an increase in individualism? It's not, it's not an increase in individualism at, at all. It, it, it is, I think it's absolutely, I think Tina said it best. And this all, <laughs> it all started in the garden, man. <laughs> right? For when you eat of the fruit, you will become like God. And that's what, th- there is a desire in each one of us to, to change pursuit of happiness within a created order where there are certain rules, both physical and moral, which, which actually guide you know, reality with self-actualization and, and reality is what I make it in. And it's my truth and it's, it's my desire to identify a particular way and that's it. And, and anything that stands in the way of me having whatever achieves that, that definition of self-actualization it is not only inconvenient, it's now bad and evil and must be overcome and defeated. And, and it's, it's a, it is almost by definition an antisocial uh, approach to everything. And so that's not individualism, that's selfishness. And, and we've, we've elevated it to almost a religion at this point. <laughs> Can I bring something up at this point? Yeah. Um, there was a book a few years back that Matt Walsh wrote called The Unholy Trinity. It's fantastic, by the way. Um, and there is just a sec- segment of what he wrote that has stuck with me ever since I read it a few years back. And uh, it says this. Self-worship has become the predominant religion in our culture. It is why we as a society have caved in on ourselves like dying stars and are now sucking each other into the black hole of our megalomania. We can't see the world outside the window because we are so busy whispering sweet nothings to our reflections in the glass. Wow. He's a good writer. I'm just, if that doesn't really reflect exactly what we're seeing around us, and you know what's crazy is he wrote this before um, like TikTok and like yeah. all Before the Matt reels. And, what year did he write this? Ah, uh, gosh, I can't remember now. Um, but he wrote it probably like eight, eight or nine years ago. I think it was before ago. Daily Wire. It was before. It was before well, Daily Wire. I mean, guys, his what he wrote is being reflected in the polls. Yeah. Of the article. One hundred percent. Like people become less and less happy as they focus more and more on themselves. Yeah. So the question is. And I, I really want to hear from like everybody, including you, Hamilton. <laughs> the, the question is, is we've gone through this poll. We've seen how depressing, let's be honest, it's pretty depressing. Yeah. The results are. Yeah. We've all kind of thrown out varying theories. And I think that, that the truth is, is a combination of all the things that we've talked about today for, for why is this happening? Why are these institutions collapsing? Why is public trust in them collapsing? Why, why do people place less value on things like patriotism, religion, having children, all that stuff? So the question is, what do we do about it? Do we do we just move into the mountains and and well, no, cut I, ourselves off from civilization? What, like like what solution is there? Because I'll be honest, and I think a lot of audience members that are listening to us live or will be listening to us after we're done are probably feeling the same way that I'm feeling, which is they're really black pilled at this point, and they're on the cusp of basically checking out mentally in terms yeah. of can you give your definition for black build in the situation um, coming to the belief that there is no way to fix a problem mm. yeah just it, it's, it's identifying a problem and recognizing there is no solution to the problem that is my basically definition despair of black I, I think it, so i also think this comes down to something that it, it is is kind of foundational all of this um and it's the idea that things are happening to us yeah okay that that's true that's true. That, that's never going to stop. There's always going to be things that happen to you. The question is, is what do you do about it? What do you do about the thing that you have within the universe that you control? So what, what do you control? And, and this was something where, um, gosh, the name is ex- escaping me now, but it, it was one of the major three schools of, of psychiatry. Um, oh, gosh, I can't believe I just forgot his name. But he, he, he actually survived the Holocaust. And, and um, he's someone that, that Peterson relies on a lot, but he was talking about how no Paul matter, young, no, 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 <laughs> he was, he was talking about no matter, no matter what situation you're in. And, and again, this is someone that is speaking from personal experience from having survived the Holocaust. He goes, no matter what situation you're in, I think it was called man's quest for meaning. And he said, even in that moment, you still have control over how you think about things. Victor Frankel. Yes. Victor Frankel. Thank you. How you think about things. 
And and people will look at that and be like, oh, that's so cliche. And of course you can say right. that, but what about all this? And, just, and, and no, it's incredibly powerful because what, what you're doing is you're saying that there, there's a part that they, they can't have. And if, and if you actually believe, and, and again, I, this is, for me, this is rooted in, in faith. And, and people get mad at me when I bring this up. I'm like, I don't know how to explain it any other way. I can't. It's impossible for me to explain it any other way and be intellectually consistent or honest with the audience. I, I believe that, again, Christianity and the, and the story within Scripture actually explains the human condition in a way that n- nothing else does. Um, but it's this idea that in, instead of focusing on a bunch of things that you can't control and never will be able to control, start focusing on the things that you absolutely can. And, and understand that certain things are a lie. And you can spend all of your time on social media or in politics, everyone screaming from the mountaintops, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. But what alternative are you providing? And, and I don't just mean an alternative in the argument that you make, although obviously I believe that's important. I'm meaning in, it, in, in what alternative are you creating in the life that you're living, in the example that you're presenting. And, and I, I will tell you right now, if, if everybody in the world came down and told me that, Nick, your job as being a, a man is not to be masculine and competitive and be a provider and protector. Your job as a husband is to not to do these things. Your job as a father is not to do these things. Your job is, if the, you can tell me all of it, I don't care. That is where I planted my flag. I believe in it. I believe in it as part of my faith. I believe in it because I have seen the fruit of what it produces in my own life, in the life of my family, in the life of my friends, in the life of people that I, I have some control over affecting. And, and that is so critical because once you've experienced something, it becomes so much harder to talk somebody out of it. But are we creating that? Are we actually creating that in our own families, and our own lives? Because if you're not, then you can scream all day long and point at the lie, but you haven't provided the truth. You've just provided what you believe to be the lie. What, what do you ask them? Even, even if you can convince them it's a lie, what do you ask them to trade it for? Because people will hold on to a convenient life or dear life if they don't know where to go once they've let it go. Oh, yes. And so th- the good news, here's the good news. Let them conduct study after study telling you you're wrong. Let them have college professor after college professor telling them you're nuts. Let them have Hollywood celebrity after Hollywood celebrity say that, that you're, you're mean and you don't understand and you're not, and you're not hip and you're boring and you're old-fashioned. And you're Let all of them say it. But if it results in you working hard and you find that purpose and meaning that God has given you, not just in, in your own accomplishments, but in, but in recognizing the most lasting monument that you're actually building is in the lives of other people and the relationships that you're creating, in, in uplifting your, your spouse, in raising and uplifting your children, in creating something beautiful and meaningful that actually transcends generations. I will point to that and say, what are you giving me in return? A government program? A protest? A monument? A building? A structure? A career? What are you giving me that compares with the meaning and purpose that is found in fulfilling God's purpose for your life and speaking in to the people that you care most about. Because you don't, you're not going to find the meaning just in, in your own self and your own ambitions. You're actually going to find it when you're fostering those sort of relationships and you're building up other people the way that you are intended to do it. And the, and the greatest part about it is that it brings with it a joy and a peace which surpasses all understanding for people on the outside looking in, wondering, why is it that this guy is doing everything that I've been told you shouldn't do is outdated, is antiquated? Why is it that it's bringing such purpose and meaning? I want to know. Because at some point, there's no study, there's no poll, there's no statistic that can override the truth in action. And so that's why ultimately I will always be optimistic for that because that is far more compelling than the narrative that is being shoved down on everyone at this point. And Christian, in response to what you asked me to talk about earlier, uh, when I was growing up, my dad had had four wheelers and everything and I would take those four wheelers out through the woods and I'd get them muddy and I'd tear them up and I'd bring them back and rightfully so. My dad would be frustrated with me that I hadn't washed them, that I didn't take better care of them. And then once I graduated college and got a job and bought my own toys, dirt bikes and things, man, I kept those things clean. <laughs> I, as soon as I got back, I'd wash it down with a pressure washer and just make sure it was shiny. 
And when we're growing up, we get on a school bus to go to a government school that's been paid for by ta- taxpayer dollars. We, if we need help, we get lunch from the government that's paid for by taxpayer dollars or inflation, whichever one. And then we, if we can't afford to go to college, we get a student loan from the federal government that we can't f- file bankruptcy on. It's with us for the rest of our lives. It's unlike any other debt out there. And every step in life, you've got the government there to help you. And I think we have removed the suffering, the sacrifice from so many things in society that we forget the value of what it is that we have in whatever it is we're doing. And I think that, you know, when my parents were growing up or my grandparents were growing up, in order to go to school, they may actually have to walk. You know, they always have that joke. But, you know, I I think there's a lot of value in that. When they went to school, they had to walk there or they had to get on a school bus that didn't have heat. They had to suffer in order to go to school. And I think that we live in a society that has demonized suffering, that everything should be convenient. And if it's not convenient, then it's too hard. And that our expectation of what is hard and what is sacrificed and what is worth sacrificing has declined so low that if we have to suffer in order to achieve this, then that's just too much. I could sit on the couch. I could watch Netflix. And we should be joyful in the suffering, in the sacrifice that we have to have in order to have good marriages, find the spouse that we want to find. You know, I think for for the longest time, I thought that I would find my spouse in, in some event that I went to or just from work. And I'm, you know, coming to the point of knowing that, okay, that's not, this, it's probably not going to work out like that. It's not going to be easy. And if <laughs> I, you know, if I want to find my... You future, mean Disney lied? <laughs> Hallmark lied? <laughs> well, and Have I've, you tried going out into the woods and singing a song with no, the birds? No, I haven't tried that. I might consider it. But, you know, during our parents' generation, you know, my, my parents uh, met each other at church. You know, they, they did, weren't going out to bars. They weren't going out to all these places. And I think now we are particularly challenged to find a spouse at our age, Christian, um, that lifelong partner. But is it worth the sacrifice? You know, Tyler sent a message. Um, our, our, our friend, <laughs> Tyler said, anything worth having is worth working for. Yeah. 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 And well, worth suffering for. But yeah. we, we've had the expectation that we shouldn't have to. Like, that's how we, we may not have that on the surface, but. That's how we end up operating. Oh, we we get we get told that essentially that, that happiness is <laughs> happiness and, and happiness is not something to pursue. It's a it's a basic human right, <laughs> and it's <laughs> and it's like all right. Well, it, let's see how that works out for you. Um, I mean, I I, I can't. Who's going to give it to you? How many how many civilizations do we have to point to? We had a uh, we have another program we do called the Y Minutes. And it's usually three minute little episodes where we illustrate a particular principle. And one of the things that we talked about was the the redefining of what it means to be free or the redefining of, of human rights. And um, in that, we talked about why is it that a person who lived in a society where the government was so dedicated to providing all of the basic human needs that you were guaranteed by law food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, a job, guaranteed, guaranteed. Unemployment rates were zero. Guaranteed. All of those things that we are told brings happiness and fulfillment. Those people risked life and limb to get on leaky rafts or to go under, over, or through the Berlin Wall in order to make it to a society which actually only promised you the freedom to be able to pursue those things. Why would you leave one that guaranteed on paper you got all of these things? Such a commitment. So altruistic. Such such a focus on on community. That it promised you that these things, no matter what happens in your life, you will be guaranteed these things. Nope, I would rather, not only would I leave that care, not only would I voluntarily leave this place to get to this place, I will risk dying and being imprisoned to leave it, to make it to the place that only offers me the freedom to pursue it. There is something in there that needs to be properly grasped that I am afraid that too many people growing up in the abundance and the security of a society which promised you the freedom, which prioritized the freedom over the stuff, 
They've gotten so used to the stuff now that they think it's a basic human right. And the moment, the moment they hand over their freedom to the government in order to expand upon those rights, to expand on the stuff, the moment they're going to realize that it was never a guarantee and that writing it down in paper and making edicts by politicians does not make it so, does not produce the resources, and they're only going to learn the hard way. And actually, they won't learn. It will be their great-grandchildren that learn the hard way that the freedom was always the best option. But freedom requires personal responsibility. It requires you to step out. It requires you to sacrifice. It requires you to work. And what you end up finding at the end of the day is that when you remove any aspect of effort or responsibility or even suffering, when you remove all of that through government edict, you're simply transferring the responsibility on somebody else to make the stuff, and you're robbing the individual of any sort of effort on their part to where now they start to see themselves as nothing more than an, organized, than an organism to be fed and entertained. And that is never going to provide... Circuses. That's never going to provide... A <laughs> Why don't we get I, to I a want Tina. I, I, I want Tina to... Because I heard from Nick, and that was awesome. And I heard from other Nick, and that was also <laughs> awesome. And I'm a little bit less less black-pilled. But, but I, I want to hear what, what Tina's take is on, on, like, we've gone through... It looks like America's going to hell in a handbasket in terms of like our, our, you know, cultural norms, societal institutions, all that type of stuff, right? We've been talking about that today. Like, how, how do you fix that problem? Well, honestly, we, we discussed the self-sorting on our last um, podcast episode. And as people self-sort, they're going to sort themselves into categories who care about these things and categories who don't. And I, I feel like you need to try to find people who care about similar things with you and um, make them your community and, and, you know, kind of try to try to help other people see the truth as well. But I think that we're also seeing a, an interesting movement on the other side of people who are trying to like, they're leaving big cities and they're going into the country and they're starting like a homestead. I mean, even if it's not like a full fledged homestead, it's like, Oh, I want chickens. Well, and they wouldn't have thought of that unless we had an egg issue, you know, or it's just this idea of getting back in touch with, you know, nature and your surroundings and community and um, ultimately in larger part getting getting back in touch with our creator because there is going to be zero purpose in life until we find um, basically he created us for a purpose we're not going to feel like we have a purpose until we find out what his purpose for us was. And we won't find fulfillment until we figure that out. And I just ultimately think that this is a time for people who are believers to um, come back to their first love. And it's also a time for people who are searching, who basically have realized that just everything else is failing them to maybe give Christ a try again um, or look into him and, um, you know, that's, that's really the, the best advice I, as a Christian that I can possibly give because you have no hope of finding a purpose outside of that. The Lord's purpose for our lives will always, the Lord's plan for our lives will always be better than what we can plan for ourselves. And there is so much more fulfillment in following what we believe to be the Lord's plan and asking for that direction than serving our own interests. Yeah. And that's not to say that things get easy at that point. Things do not. They do well, not. And people, people but, but, but there is this idea that what is this struggle for? I don't even know what this struggle is for. And I don't want to struggle because I don't know what the struggle is for. If you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you know that there is a purpose and that you know there's a payoff and there is, you know, influence you can have and there is um, purpose that you can have on the other side of this struggle, it makes it a lot easier to go through the struggle. I endured the most pain of my life having my babies. But I knew on the other side of that, I would get to hold my baby and I would get to be a mom. And, and I think that any struggle uh, that seems like there is no purpose in it and there, that there is no payoff on the other side is going to just lead to depression and despair. But if you know what your purpose is and you know that there is something beyond yourself that, that you're doing this for, I, I think that's, that's when yeah. the struggle becomes worth it. Hamilton, you said you wanted to read off a comment or two, right? I did. I, I'm going to be honest, everyone, on the live stream. <laughs> I, I thought I was going to be able to pay closer attention to what everyone was saying, and I'd be able to grab a few things. So, Tina, if you have anything that you've seen, 
Um, well, I also well, want to tell everyone, I, I want to thank, go, while you're looking at that, I also want to thank everybody for, for why, I mean, we've had a lot of people watching the live stream. We're, we're going to, we're going to constantly improve this. We've got some other oh, yeah. ideas that we're bringing on to be, actually bring up live chats. We want to do more audience participation throughout the show, right? Our, our goal is to, to go through, to talk about various categories and to allow people to come on and actually ask questions live and for us to stop and engage with those questions. Um, so, you know, again, thank you for watching this. Please continue to give us feedback. I've been, I've been looking at some of the comments here as we're, yeah. as we're going, but, uh, we're going to continue to, to do that and create the sort of environment where you guys are regularly interacting with the show mm -hmm. as we're talking. That's the whole reason why we went live. Uh, this whole reason why we made this decision. I, I think it's going to be a lot better to have that audience interaction. And so. currently we have a lot more interaction going on and a lot more viewers over on our old channel, which is the Nick Freitas channel. Mm -hmm. And, um, folks, we are switching our show, the podcast, over to its own channel. It's the Making the Argument channel. And if you go to the link um, in this uh, live stream, you can go and be a part of that channel. And that is where you're going to find this content. You're yep. it, Eventually, you won't find it here anymore. And that's why we introduced to today. One of the folks said, hey, I don't like going back and forth to see the chat. I don't like this chat in two yeah. sections. And here's the thing is... Um, I know it's frustrating, but eventually it's going to just be one and it's going to be the new one. So please move over there. And we are going to have so much content being published on that channel. And to our audio listeners who have made it this long, we are also going to do our best to keep the audio experience as good for you all as possible. And so if you all have any feedback for us, our folks that listen on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, uh, you know, and you're a member of Volley, let us know how the audio experience was today. That would be very helpful because we don't want to leave you all behind and we're intent on making sure we don't do that. All right, well, I'm going to hand it back to Nick, I think, to wrap us out. No, hey, listen, thank you very much for everyone that has stuck with us, that has watched this, that will watch it after the fact. Please let us leave us some comments on what you would like to see us. If you, if you watch other live stream uh, podcast shows and you, and you see some of the things that they do that you, you might like us to replicate, again, our goal is to involve you as much in the conversation as possible. We had to do this first one, which was primarily kind of how we've done the show in the past, but live. But please know, going forward, the whole goal is to have you asking questions as we're talking, helping us to actually direct the conversation so that we are helping you make the argument. Once again, I'm your host, Nick Freitas. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next live stream.